Hi, I'm June Russell. I'm with Grow NYC, based in New York City. Um, that is uh, some of the naked barley there at our teaching garden out on Governor's Island. So if, you, if and when you come to New York City, it's a good day trip out to Governor's Island to see our teaching garden there. And we now have about nine grain beds um, to you know, demonstrate where bread and beer comes from. Um, and we're excited about the, the naked barley there. Um, for those of us uh, folks who don't know us, we uh, are Grow NYC, we're a nonprofit organization based in New York City. This year we'll be celebrating our 50th anniversary. Green Market came along in 1976. Um, we run a lot of programs. Uh, we are a small army of staff that spread out across the city, literally on the sidewalks of New York City, doing composting programs, farmers markets. Uh, textile recycling, uh, teaching gardening, um, it's an amazing organization. Uh, here's our map with our green market region here on the left and this is our market system here on the right. Um, and this was, this is the, like, where our farms come from. This is the Finger Lakes here up uh, in the, the left here of the corner. Most of our folks come from the Hudson Valley region but we also cover New Jersey and out into Pennsylvania and up into Vermont. So back in 2007 when I moved into my position, I was asked to do something about green market bakers. Um, that was literally our territory uh, for me to go out in and try to find other uh, potential collaborators who was doing anything with grains in the Northeast. Um, it was about three years of kind of asset mapping we would call today. We didn't really realize that today there's a term called value chain development. Um, about after three years of identifying some collaborators and some sources, we created this rule that required our bakers to use 15% local grain. Um, so I really want to acknowledge Don Lewis in the room who was an inspiration for that rule definitely, who had, was a baker in the program at the time and was milling flour into his baked goods and it was a strategy that had worked for him and we implemented that as a way to not overwhelm our bakers. We hear you, we don't want to bust your bottom line and we don't know how local flour is going to perform but we had to start somewhere and, and the intention of the rule was to push those bakers to become more mission supportive uh, as management. We are charged with managing that space on behalf of agriculture and at that time we had lots of bakers who were using commodity flour and making banana bread and things that we couldn't really justify. Um, so 2009, that rule was created, it went into effect in 2010. Um, I wanted to throw this slide up in the beginning of 2010, just 10 years ago, we had our first big convening going outside of the green market community, realizing that grains are a big heavy lift and that this wouldn't be achievable just with our uh, network of bakers. So you can see down there on the left, there's Tor with dark hair in the red shirt there. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Greg Mall is in there, Klaus Maria Hallmartens also. Um, this is literally the samples that we were working with. This is Frederick right here. This is about how much we had. Um, I'm happy to report that this was the event that Jim Lay, he said he could make uh, anything out of dog shit wheat. Um, and happy to report that we have really excellent wheat coming out of the Northwest and bakers making really, really great breads. And, quite an achievement for everybody in this network. Um, I'll go through this pretty quickly. There's a lot of background on work we've done to try to support developments over the years. Um, some case studies, videos, things that are available on our website, fact sheet for growers. This is work we did with Elizabeth Dick, another uh, important player um, in helping some of this evolve. And Nofa New York certainly was an incredible resource and meeting point for convenings for many, many years. Um, Cornell, we've been partners with since 2011, working on some of those variety trials and quality evaluations. We've been able to bring seven varieties from that project to the market. Um, this was our first crack at making a grain shed map. This is from 2013. Uh, in 2010, there were literally three points on this map. Uh, there's a later version of this 
that was updated maybe four years ago and we, we stopped updating because there are so many points on the map now where we have malting facilities, new mills that are popping up. Um, but this was sort of the concept and realizing that New York City is a giant marketplace, all good things flow to the city and that we could help support this, this entire region uh, because of the potential of the market that we have available. Um, by 2014, there were a lot of things that were in development that were becoming available, um, but our growers who were working in this space were busy scaling up their mills to the next level. And so we recognized our greatest asset being the marketplace and set up a tent and table and started selling some of these grains uh, on behalf of producers. So we are now going into our sixth year um, in 2015, we incorporated craft beverages as a means to help support uh, brewers and distillers that were uh, operating under those farm distillery licenses and farm brewery licenses. It's now become an integral part of the grain stand. And this is an example of our warehouse up in the Bronx on the left that is entirely full of local flour that didn't exist uh, 10 years ago. And then one of my favorite images of our grain stand at Rockefeller Center, kind of the heart of New York City and um, New York culture there. And this is a couple images of our small uh, retail operation where we can hold about four or five pallets of products. We repackage into retail units, stage our markets. We do about four, uh, five markets a week in the fall. Um, and these are some of the products that we've been able to pull through at very varied levels of scale. We've brought on products as uh, small as 200 pound lots and you know are working with folks who have hundred thousands of pounds of, of wheat. Um, so it's been a really good place to test market and, and capture customer feedback. Um, we've also moved into working with beans. Uh, mostly with Vermont Bean Crafters and Joe Boson who's here. Um, a lot, we sell every single bean we put out on the table. It's a big market opportunity there to work beans into rotation as well. And we also help get an oil seed producer launched uh, who's working with local growers to get hemp, camelina, canola, and sunflower oils. Um, our growth has been incremental but substantial for the past four years been able to move over uh, close to two million uh, dollars worth of product between our wholesale and retail programs. I'm going to shift at this point a little bit because Andrew wanted me to talk about um, compliance, but I wanted to give some background on the things that we have done and are currently doing. So we are the nonprofit uh, 501c3. Our mission is to promote regional agriculture and bring fresh food to New Yorkers. Um, this is our Union Square market on the right, and our neighborhood market at Fort Greene, Brooklyn, is on the left. Um, so one thing that's different, I think, with the conversation, sorry about this, you guys, <laughs> is that we have contract, we have an agreement with all of our producers, as I said, our, our charge is to manage the space uh, in New York City on behalf of our mission. And every year we do an uh, application process with our producers. And so within that contract is an agreement um, to keep documentation and that there is an inspections process and that's another part of my role at the organization. Um, so access is really the incentive for producers. Um, when we implemented the rule, we had worked for several years already to prime our bakers for this change. And it was kind of amazing to see everybody come on board and also recognizing that the market was that valuable that they were willing to make those changes. And basically we said, we don't, you know, you can use any grain, we'll also include beans. As long as you hit the 15% mark, that is a, one of the requirements for participation. That's an eligibility requirement. Um, but I think that using participation as the carrot has definitely been a successful strategy. Um, and then you definitely need, based on experience, we need the stick as well. Um, this is a sheet from our most recent Baker audits. We do those uh, reviewing purchases, looking in a year's uh, receipts, and just doing the math of how much is 
uh, are the bakeries using in total, how much of that is local. So you can see like, we have a big range in scale. Um, we've got about 32 bakeries at the market, half are farm-based, half are commercial. So those farm-based bakeries are really, a lot of them are orchards that are doing cider donuts, muffins, very small scale. They might use 100 pounds of flour a month. And then you have commercial bakeries that are using uh, 15,000 pounds a month and more. Um, this, in 2018, we raised the minimum to 25% and that went into effect last year. And somebody had asked me a question about this earlier. When we did the audits, the average was 38%. And somebody asked me if we got any pushback on raising that limit and, and we didn't. I think most folks were, uh, as they should be, were proud of uh, that collective achievement and wanted to stay on the forefront as leaders and so everybody was actually in support of raising that percentage to 25. So altogether our bakers use about 65,000 pounds a month and that adds up to about 300 acres of wheat per year. So as you can see that's um, you know that's that's a very small part of the market um, but and also why we wanted to go outside and engage our additional allies because to make this work on a larger scale it's a heavy lift and we need all folks involved, all hands on deck and making that happen. Uh, here's some examples of the products. We've seen a lot of great innovation in the marketplace. On the right is Bread Alone's Nordic Breads, um, the Spell to Rye, the Einkorner, the Rye Bread Einkorn did not exist on any scale 10 years ago. Um, Runner and Stone has excellent baked goods. Uh, they also have an einkorn croissant and a white spelt pretzel. Um, Lost Bread is working with Pennsylvania Redeemer, um, also making really excellent products. So one of the core values of the compliance program is to have transparency. Um, and that is one of our greatest values is to be able to trace this back to the farm. Again, the mission of the program is to support regional agriculture. So we want to make sure that these initiatives are actually going to benefit our uh, regional farmers. Um, in thinking about this, I was thinking about the examples of fraud that I've seen over the years. Um, there's two different kinds, basically. There's an unintentional and an intentional. Um, the unintentional is usually a third party source. Uh, I think with brewers and distillers in particular, um, it is a weak link uh, in the transparency chain when you're buying through a third party. I've had folks tell me that they're buying from uh, a feed mill um, and they may think the person they bought it from may be telling them that this is New York grain, but if there's no way to trace that back, um, we can't really verify that. So they may think that they're getting New York grain and it's actually the source farm that's being unscrupulous, but part of this also has to do with the community building where that uh, source would need to know that it matters, this matters to us, that, it's, that it is a big deal, that it's not coming from uh, New York. Um, and then there's the, un the intentional obfuscation where folks just don't keep their paperwork or a little bit chaotic and so you can't really do the trace back. Um, I think one thing to, for us to consider is the European uh, appellation system that was implemented in the early 90s. And the wine industry has been using this for a long time. You'll see that in the AOCs, DOCs. Um, but they're based on agricultural regions and protecting traditional foods. Um, we have a different problem than that because as a colonial nation, we don't have traditional foods. Um, but because of the local foods movement, we are now identifying with our regions. So this gives us an opportunity to establish our own sense of identity through our agriculture and our foods. Um, and this is something we can talk about <clears throat> in the breakout session around uh, accountability. But this is a, doing some reading up on this to prepare and it's a very good system to take a look at and for us to consider. Um, and again, the, the having the verification part of it, um, just based on experience, I think has 
a lot of value and is important to the credibility of the labels um, and the campaigns that there is some kind of accountability mechanism that will be available through an association or some kind of third party verification that can do audits. A um, couple of examples of those folks in New York have created the Empire Rye Association with uh, production criteria and then this is also an example of the Neapolitan uh, pizza that is a similar association that has uh, strict regulations for production called a disciplinaire that alone was kind of intimidating um, and there's a board that will review applications and approve whether or not you have you know the true method for making Neapolitan pizza. Uh, that's is our updated crane shed map on the left um, and like I said there's many more points on that uh, today and there's also an updated version of our market map in New York City and this is our Union Square Market where we are every Wednesday and Saturday so if you're in the city you can find us there thank you